Could you start with your name and job title, please? Uh, Osman Samuddin. I'm the senior editor at ESPN Cricket Book. All right. Uh, Scottish Cricket thought they were going to be a full member in 2021. Uh, since then, they've gone through... I'm just, I'm just looking at my notes to make sure I'm right. Four CEOs, three chairs, and an entire board stood down when Cricket Scotland was seen as institutionally racist. That seems like quite a departure from we're about to become a full member of the ICC. Yeah, it's, it's almost like they jinxed themselves by actually applying to become a full member in, in 2021 when they did. But yeah, like, you know, they, they've been through a, a hell of a like rough period over the last 18, 19 months. Started off, of course, and we'll get into it, I guess. It started off with the, with the report, the Changing the Boundaries report that came out, which found that uh, the Cricket Scotland itself was institutionally racist and that the game in Scotland at a broader level uh, was, you know, replete with kind of exclusionary behavior and, and, and racist behavior. And, and since then, it's kind of snowballed into this crisis at board level, by the way, because we're watching the Cricket Scot- we're watching Scotland team do amazing things at the World Cup qualifiers. You know, they, they, they win against Netherlands, or if they don't lose too badly, they can still get through to the World Cup, which will be amazing. Mm-hmm. So the team's doing well, but this crisis is kind of, uh, confined itself just at board level right now. And of course, you know, eventually if that crisis keeps going on, then it will have an impact on the team. You know, it, it, it's remarkable that it hasn't had an impact on the team yet. But uh, at, at some point, you've got to think if they don't sort themselves out, then there will be some bad stuff happening to that team as well. And obviously, while this isn't direct, directly related to Azim Rafiq, it sort of comes from Azim Rafiq. Um, and then there's obviously the two uh, 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 Scottish players who are involved who kind of what move it forward or bring it to attention i don't know the best way of putting it but they they start uh everything really don't they yeah i think majid majid huck and Qasim sheikh you know former internationals for scotland majid huck is still like the leading all-time international wicket taker uh for for scotland uh really like big big scottish player like you know one of the biggest names in the game over there uh it, it was their allegations that that came out um, just after, so, you know, Majid, in fact, I spoke to Majid and he, and he said that he had watched Azim Rafiq's testimony in front of the, the DCMS committee in November 21. And it kind of triggered in him the thinking that he, you know, he felt much the same way. And, you know, sometimes it needs, it needs to watch somebody else going through it for you to understand what you're, what you've gone through. And it kind of triggered in him this thinking that, you know, he'd been through similar experiences and that like Azim, that his career had been ended because of racism, essentially. And so he became, and I think what, what Azim allowed uh, guys like Majid and Qasim was to, was to come out and be very open about the, the kind of experiences that they've, that, that they've had. Uh, and, and, you know, they could literally, I think it was a week later that they spoke to Sky Sports. Uh, and, and that, so this was like late November 2021, and that sparked off the, the, this call for a review and, uh, and an investigation, which led to Cricket Scotland hiring uh, Plan for Sport, which is like an outside firm which deals with issues of uh, equity and diversity and inclusion and, and carries out these kind of reviews. They hired them uh, to, to, to put out this review, which then came out in July 2022, which is when you know, we kind of the media at large and, and a lot of fans would have first heard about like these kind of, you know, the, the big, uh, the, the big kind of findings of the report. Um, and, the, and the findings were that, you know, Cricket Scotland failed uh, on 29 out of 31 indicators of institutional racism and that there were, and, and, the, and the writing of the report was a little bit woolly here, but they said that there were 448 cases that they had mapped against which it seemed like they had failed on uh, like 448 instances of uh, institutional racism that they had mapped. Um, and that was it, of course, you know, then the headlines blew out from that, that Cricket Scotland was racist and, 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 you know, action needed to be taken. And the day before this report was published, the entire board of, of Cricket Scotland taking full responsibility and said that, you know, we apologize for this, for, for whatever, for the culture that's been created, saying that we have not yet the report in full, but we take full responsibility and we're stepping down. Um, yeah. And, and it's gone on from then. It's, it's just continued kind of getting, getting, getting worse and worse, really, since, since then. Well, I mean, the 448 
the the issue with that now is that it's not 448 issues of institutional racism. I'm not saying there never has been 448, but that's not really what the report says, is it? No. So 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 what you know the report didn't say that much about those cases ever, and and what really came out much later, and this is like you know some of the questions that former officials, so the former chair of Cricket Scotland, Tony Bryan, has been you know he stepped down two months before the report came out uh, for health reasons. It's never been kind of expanded upon why he stepped down, but health reasons, they said. And he'd been a long-time chair. He'd been chair since 2015, I think. And, and, and he's been one of the kind of leading voices raising questions against this report and really kind of putting, throwing more scrutiny on this report. And so of the 448 cases, you know, nobody knew anything about this really, about the detail of it, until in one update, like in January, so this is like now you know, six, seven months later, they said of those 448 cases, 248 were related to like policy documentation and governance at Cricket Scotland. So, you know, a lot of people kind of, a lot of people didn't see that. A lot of people still haven't seen that figure. But it wasn't that there were 448 cases of somebody going up and being racist against somebody else, which is what that initial headline may have suggested. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people said, oh my God, 448 cases of like, it wasn't. It was a, half of those cases were Cricket Scotland not having the right, policy in place or not the right paperwork in place for an ED&I, uh, 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 you know, uh, policy. So, yes, that is a failing, but it's a different kind of failing. And you've got to put that failing in perspective. And this is, you know, the, the crux of this, the, the piece that I reported on. You've got to put it in perspective against the kind of board that Cricket Scotland are. You know, they're essentially a very small organization, kind of borderline amateur run, uh, very little full-time staff. Uh, a lot of the resources that they do get, the funding that they get from the ICC and and only very few other places, are you know goes towards just keeping that board running every day and keeping it alive. So, and, and Tony Bryan said this uh, uh, at one point. He said that you know uh, we're sorry that we're not at the cutting edge of kind of policy development and and keeping the, our documents up in order on on EDNI because. <laughs> we're like five people working at Cricket Scotland. And, and, and during the pandemic, we were lucky to still be around. You know, a lot of us got furloughed, a lot of the staff got furloughed. And when we came back from the pandemic, when things started happening, the, 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 the pressure then was just to keep the board afloat, literally. Uh, and, and so, mm. you know, that was one of the things about the report that I felt was reasonable to question is there was no detail on these 448 cases that people spoke about. And headlines were allowed to kind of billow out from it and balloon out into something that put a different perspective on what the problems were. Yeah. I, I won't Cause, say it's cause there's, wrong. There's a difference between, a yeah, there's a difference between 448 cases of someone being racially abused and 448 cases where 239 of them are paperwork, which we still would agree should be done correctly and it all leads to, to other issues. But there is a big difference about that. Um, the, the small... Um, uh, Cricket Scotland thing. So when I worked for them, there was one mm. man whose job was head of high performance. He was the team manager. He was a strength and conditioning coach. And I'm pretty sure, I think I've got this right, that his deputy head of high performance or his assistant or whatever it was, was uh, away on maternity or paternity leave. So he was doing that job as well. So it just tells you how, and that was before COVID. So you can imagine after COVID, you know, they lost even more stuff. Um, uh, tell us about Anjan Luthra. So, okay, so, you know, your point about this is, is kind of the main point. You've worked there, you have experience of it. You know, the more I kind of researched about it, the more the smallness of Cricket Scotland kind of works against it in these situations. So one of the things, so Anjan Luthra, which I'll get to in a second, but one of the things that happened under his tenureship, which led to his resignation and the whole thing really kind of blowing up, was that they were, they were the, the Cricket Scotland board was asked a question uh, by... Uh, running out racism, and we'll come to running out racism and cricket Sco uh, and sports Scotland in a second. But they were asked this question about what they were doing. So this is all after the report. They were asked this question about what they're doing on a certain EDI thing that they had to kind of fulfil as a result of the report. They didn't get an answer back from Cricket Scotland uh, for like five six weeks, and and they complained about it. They they used that as a point, like you know we've asked you questions about EDI and I and what you're doing on it, and you haven't responded to us in like five six weeks. Now Anjan, when I spoke to him, said. Well, you know why that was, was because the person who that email was sent to was not on maternity leave, but on kind of long-term illness. And so that email just went to her inbox or their inbox. 
and nobody else saw it until that person came back and they were like, oh, this is something that we should have responded to like a while ago. And everyone was like, oh my God, let's respond to it now. But you know, in a, in a bigger organization, there would have been somebody else who would have just taken over. But in a smaller organization like Cricket Scotland, it doesn't happen automatically, right? These things get lost. So Anjan Lusra is, is the chairperson. He was the chairman of the board. Uh, he was appointed in October 2022. Um, and it was seen at the time as a very progressive kind of appointment. He's of Indian origin, uh, Scottish. He's you know played cricket at junior level, under nineteen level, and tennis at under nineteen level. So like an athlete, and then he was also uh, and and is also currently a successful entrepreneur. He's he's set up like a uh, he set up I think thrills dot com is the is a website that I I remember is this big kind of celebrity website where you you can go to a celebrity and you can ask them for like a personalized video message and and he set that up it's basically startup. his version of cameo isn't it exactly yeah so you know he's a successful guy and he, and and he came highly recommended from among others majid Huck himself uh and they had known each other they had played with each other at junior level uh and 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 so he came highly recommended this guy who's going to get things done and you know he's a diversity uh he 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 fulfills that kind of you know, that box that he is uh, of, of Indian origin. Um, and, and he started off, and I think, you know, he, he's very much like a kind of guy who just wants to get stuff done. And, and he came into Cricket Scotland, and given his kind of business experience, he saw an organization that, of course, needed the issue of institutional racism resolving, but he also saw an organization that just needed overhauling completely because anybody of that kind of background who would come into an associate member cricket board would look at it and say, oh my God, we need to like, you know, we need to keep this board afloat and then we need to make it just bigger and better, I think. So his, you know, his agenda, and he was very open about it from the start, was that, yes, I will deal with the consequences of that report. We will, we will work on that. Uh, and, but I also need to make Cricket Scotland just more, uh, just, just more kind of viable. And his first thing, you know, the first thing he realized was that if we don't do something about it pretty quickly, because I've just come in after the pandemic and we've been hit doubly hard because all our matches have been cancelled, we need to earn some money. Uh, and we need to start making money because if we don't have money, then we don't have Cricket Scotland. And then if we don't have Cricket Scotland, the issue of the racism just becomes moot. It, it, mm. it doesn't exist. So he started working on that kind of twofold agenda. Um, and I think eventually, over the next few months, very quickly actually, uh, I think these kind of differences of opinion emerged between the other kind of stakeholders in the game. So now this is where Running Out Racism, which is a campaign group, uh, which is you know, set up after the Azim Rafiq thing happened, which very good intentions, you know, they want to kind of eradicate racism from the game. Uh, but they became very, they're, you know, they're a volunteer campaign group, but they became very important in the running of the board uh, 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 who were now being run also after the racism report came out, they were now being run by Sport Scotland, which is the national kind of body for sport in Scotland. Uh, so, you know, it's a fairly emergency-like situation. You have the national sports body in Scotland now effectively running Cricket Scotland. Uh, so they had a hand in Anjan's appointment. Running out racism are a very important stakeholder because of the racism report. They're now very important. And, but you know, these, these three kind of bodies came together and Anjan is the third one. They came together and they clashed over various things about the pace of change happening there. Uh, and so it led to essentially um, Anjan resigning and he resigned after Cricket Scotland's own advisory EDNI group resigned after they'd all had one meeting in which apparently it wasn't a very good meeting that they'd had in I think February. <laughs> after Anjan took over, uh, it wasn't a very good meeting. And I think, you know, essentially, Jared, it boils down to the fact that I think both Sports Scotland and Running Out Racism wanted Anjan to be just quicker and harder and firmer on, on the racism aspect of that report, the Changing the Boundaries report, on implementing those changes. And Anjan kind of pushing back, because he's a strong personality, pushing back and saying, but yes, I will be, but... I also need to sort the board out, which is a completely valid, I think, in my opinion, a completely valid position to take is that, you know, you need to sort the board out as well as dealing with that. And I think it became too much for Anjan at one point. He was just like, well, you know, I'm not going to, it's a fairly toxic atmosphere. It was a very toxic atmosphere because he was falling out with Majid and Qasim Sheikh all throughout this as well. I think very quickly it happened. There's a bit of ego involved. Uh, you know, they knew each other. It's a small well, kind you of... 
small requirements. Yeah, you also, you, you talked about the whole Nigel Farage thing in your piece, right? Which is, you, you said before, oh, they picked him because he's progressive. And then it turns out he's got a business relationship with Nigel Farage. Now, I'm not saying they're best friends or they share politics, but there were, there's also rumors about him being a pro-Donald Trump guy. Like, he suddenly didn't look like the progressive candidate at this point, right? Yeah, at, at 100%. His, and, I, and I wrote in piece that, you know, like if you go through his social media timeline, like you will have reservations if you are one way inclined. You will have reservations about the kind of opinions and the kind of things that he backs and stuff. But, you know, the, the, the Nigel Farage thing was, was weird because it was very weird. And it actually really illustrative, I think, of the way this whole thing was operating. Nigel Farage was an open thing. Like Anjan Luthra had signed up Nigel Farage for the thrills.com thing. So, you know, if you wanted a celebratory birthday message from Nigel Farage, you could go to thrills.com. And who does and say, it? Hey. <laughs> As everyone does, maybe, or not. But, you know, so, and he was on the homepage of the thrills website from like November 21, like November 2021. So it was, it was open. He wasn't hiding it. Mm, um, yeah. And then he was appointed chairman on the suggestion of guys like Majid Haq. And, and with the, you know, with the blessing of Sports Scotland, they played a fairly leading role in that. He was hired as the chairman for the board a year later. So all this time, everyone should know, who knows Anjan, should know that, okay, he has Anjan Luthra on his website. He has a working relationship with him. By the way, Anjan Luthra has said on the record to me that it's not necessary for me to share the same political opinions with people that I work with. So, you know, he's not saying what his political opinions are, but he has said that it's not necessary that I share the opinions of people that I have a business relationship with. Fair enough. Um, and so then suddenly once he's resigned, so this is now like what, almost 18 months after everyone should know that he has a working relationship with Nigel Farage. After he resigns, it suddenly comes out in a newspaper that, oh, oh my God, he is working with Nigel Farage. And what's more, he even joked about it with Majid Haq. Uh, in, in, in the lead up to it. Um, so, you know, these WhatsApp messages were released, were leaked out to the paper in which he was joking about it. And like Anjan confirmed those WhatsApp messages with me when he spoke to me. He kind of you know, showed me one while we were talking and stuff. And yeah, they were there. So it, it wasn't a secret. It was there from the start. It should have been flagged if it had to be flagged, which you can argue, yeah, sure. You know, if you're hiring this guy and he's friends with Nigel Farage and you've just had this racism thing blow up in your faces, then maybe you should flag this kind of stuff before you hire that guy. Completely fair enough. But once you've hired him, and it seems like he knows what he's talking about, then you have a separate problem on your hands. So, you know, it, it just, I think for me, it was very illustrative of, like, the, the weird macro and very micro personality-based issues that have fueled what's happening at Cricket Scotland. And, you know, Anjan then left in, in uh, when was it, March, I think, March or April. And now... You know, you, we talked about it. They're looking for another chair. Uh, they're looking for another CEO as well. They're looking for a board director. Um, they, they they've just put up a new... I think since your article went up, they put up a new thing asking anyone to um, uh, for a survey of any experiences of Scottish cricket, which I, I'm not saying it's a bad idea. Obviously, I think they're copying what the ECB did. But at a certain point, I'm like, who's going to process all this information? Like, you don't have anyone that works for you. You know, and, and there's cases, right? So there's referrals. So there's these things that, that happen from after the report when they did canvas all these experiences from the public. And so they're investigating. The number is really confusing, but I think they are formally investigating uh, over 20 cases of like racist or exclusionary behavior that has happened to players in Scotland. Uh, whether that's, you know, and some of those cases involve the national team, players within the national team, you know, there's very little known about these cases. And I don't think we can talk much about them because just for legal purposes, but there will be impact from those cases once they're finally investigated fully, there will be impact uh, on like, you know, fairly well-known personalities in Scottish cricket uh, and, and, you know, who have been part of the setup and, and who are kind of just, just generally well-known. So those cases are still continuing. Um, and, and they're just going to have, like we had with the ECB in the Yorkshire case, they're going to have continuing fallout and implication. Every time it happens, there's going to be like, you know, there's going to be media coverage of it and it's going to hurt the team. Like, I feel bad for the team. I know Melinda was traveling with the team. Melinda Farrell, who we both know, was, was traveling with the team. Well, she wasn't traveling with the team, but she was covering their series of matches in Antigua recently. Mm -hmm. 
um, Scotland's matches. And so she, you know, she spends some time with the team. And, you know, it, it's clearly impacting the team as well. Like, you know, they're, they're representing Scotland. What they're doing is like, they're, what they're doing is amazing. They're playing for Scotland. They've got them to the verge of the World Cup now um, against all odds. And yet, when most people who are not that familiar with the story and do not follow Scotland cricket often, when most people look at them, when they turn up at the World Cup, for example, fingers crossed, they, they qualify, they turn up at the World Cup. Most of the people are going to be looking at them saying, ah, well, yeah, you guys are that racist team, aren't you? And <laughs> they're not. They just happen to come from a board where, like, this whole racism thing is blown out. Um, it's not been handled in the best way, but it's led to turbulence. And, and they're going to be kind of, you know, weighed down by that. And it's really unfortunate because, you know, I'm, I'm sure that team environment, I think, is better now. Even Majid, I was speaking to Majid, and, you know, he has cousins and, 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 and nephews, I think, who are still part of the yeah, setup. I think, or, or, I think or, isn't his yeah. nephew, um, yes. oh my God, Hamza Tahir, isn't it? Is it his nephew or is he? I think so, yes. Cousin? Yeah. yeah. So I, Hamza and, you know, is the new left arm himself. finger spinner. He's replaced um, Majid yes. and he's a brilliant young bowler and he was there yeah. when I was there as well. I say young, he's probably not young anymore. Um, but, yeah, uh, but he was I, young, and, young you know, Majid I... says that his experiences are, are better than Majid's own words. And, you know, the one important thing in this I, I think that we need to keep stressing over and over again is that there is no denying or 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 belittling or somehow reducing whatever Majid and Qasim and other players in Scotland have gone through. Like I, I, I don't have evidence for it and I'm sure some of it will come out in the investigations, but I'm sure they would have gone through uh, exclusionary behavior, downright racist behavior, because it does happen. That That is an absolute fact. Um, I just my my only thing with this whole thing is that I, I feel like it's it's been dealt with badly. I think Sports Scotland have a lot of questions to answer, which they're avoiding. They're not answering. We've tried to reach out to them so many times. They're not answering those questions. Uh, plan for sport. The people who carried out the investigation, they have some questions they should answer. Running out racism, I think, are actually doing a pretty good thing. Paul Reddish is is a good guy. He knows his stuff, and, and I think he's very aware of you know, what they don't want Scotland cricket to go down. They don't want them to go down the route of English cricket where it becomes really polarised. I think they're a little bit late. I think it's already happened there. It's, it's fairly polarised, the atmosphere in places. Um, but I think it's, it's not been handled well. And that's unfair on guys like Majid as well. Majid and Qasim himself. I think it's unfair on how it's been, how, how it's played out. Um, and it's unfair. I, I'm sure it'll be unfair on some of those guys who've been, you know, tarred with uh, being maybe implicated in the reports who may have not may not have done anything but you know because of these headlines that we've kind of seen they get tarred in the same brush uh, you know like I, I think you were you were part of the setup in 2018 was it no what, what yeah 2018 or 2019 was it something like that so you know like could, could this, this period covers like the period in that report it's not specified as such but you know it could be from any time from 2015 2016 onwards to like maybe last year and that's the point like none of it there's no detail there's no idea of what kind of what era are we dealing with what what scale of crisis are we dealing with what scale of racism are we dealing with there's no real indication of that apart from these numbers and and you know these numbers we've just picked through them a little bit are not quite what they seemed at the time there yeah. there's a different perspective on those numbers than than what we first thought when they first came out no definitely there's no easy answers there Usman thank you very much for coming on the podcast thank you for having me